to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. We must work the works of him who sent us while it is day. For night comes when no man works. John chapter 9, verse 4. Welcome to our study of Old Testament lessons. These lessons are designed to encourage and strengthen us in the work of God. And today as we think about Nehemiah and the great work they did, there is strength and encouragement to be gained for leadership in the church today. Think about the background of Nehemiah for just a minute. Due to sin, their idolatry, and their infidelity to God, the Jews were eventually taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. Now this happened by the hand of God, for God promised in Jeremiah 25 and in Jeremiah 29 that Nebuchadnezzar was going to come. Because of their idolatry, he was going to take them away into 70 years of captivity. But then, after that captivity, Cyrus, God's servant, was going to be used, Isaiah 45 verse 1, to bring the people back home. In the year 539, Persia took over Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar was forced out of control. The year 536 occurs and Cyrus, king of Persia, now makes a decree that the people of God can return home. They're now going to begin the great project of rebuilding the temple, restoring the walls, and making sure that their relationship with God is right. Just as the Jews left in three, three deportations, they also return in three ways. Zerubbabel and the people return to the city and the temple to restore it. Ezra returns with the people and they're there to restore the law and morality. And then Nehemiah and the people return to restore the wall, their defense, and the gates. For Nehemiah to lead the people to do in days what had not been done in 13 years, he had to follow some very specific leadership principles. Oh, how we need today leadership in the church. The work that God's leaders have set before them is so much more important than the work of restoring the walls and rebuilding the temple. We have the great work of taking the gospel to the whole world. Matthew 28 verse 18, of standing as a beacon of truth and making sure the church is what God wants it to be. What can leaders today glean from Nehemiah to be the kind of leaders God wants them to be? Nehemiah was first of all successful because he was a man of diligent, constant prayer to God. For him to complete the building that he had set before him, he would often stop and make a sudden and short prayer to God. Nehemiah chapter 1, he prays for help as he confesses his sins and the sins of the people. Nehemiah prays in times of fear. Nehemiah chapter 2, he's about to go before the king, he's about to face the critics. He prays. He prays concerning his enemies. Nehemiah chapter 4 verses 4 through 5. He prays for protection from God against his enemies. And ultimately in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 9, Nehemiah prays for strength. As we look at Nehemiah and as we think about leaders today, like Nehemiah, we need to develop the mindset of putting our trust in God and the power of prayer. Friend, we can't underestimate the power of prayer. Notice what the scripture says in James 5 verse 16. The Bible says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. Look at the power prayer has. It can overcome. It can give us strength. And thus, like Nehemiah, we need to be a people of prayer. We begin like Nehemiah began realizing our sin and asking God to help us overcome that sin and making confession to Him. 1 John 1 verse 8 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity. Like David in Psalm 51 verses 3 and 4, we need to say to God, I've sinned against you and you only. And we need to realize that sin, if it's not confessed and if it's not repented of, will separate a man from God. Sin hinders our prayer. Psalm 66 and verse 18, the psalmist said, If I regard iniquity in my heart, 
the Lord will not hear. Proverbs 28 and verse 9, if we stop listening to the law of God, even our prayer is an abomination to him. And so if we're going to begin, we've got to start with prayer by looking inside and making sure, are we right with God? Have we as leaders made our life right? And are we really trying to guide God's people? We must pray to God in times of fear as well that he'll give us the strength. To act like we're not afraid is to be foolish. All of us face fears. All of us face difficulties, but the good news is in those times of fear, in times when we have struggles in our life, God is no further away than the avenue of prayer and he's willing and wants to help each one of us. I love the words of Luke chapter 18 verse 1. Notice what Jesus says here. Then he, Jesus, spoke a parable to them that men ought always to pray and never lose heart. You ever get discouraged? You ever feel like sometimes just throwing in the towel and giving up? Especially for leaders, no doubt there's that sense of frustration. What do you do when you just don't know if you can go anymore, when you're facing fear? Jesus said men ought to pray always and never lose heart. Don't give up. Turn to God in prayer. Ask him for help, and God will help us. Acts 16, 25, that had to be what Paul and Silas were doing. How is it that in a, a deep, dark dungeon in Philippi, Paul and Silas are praying and singing hymns to God? They knew that God would help. Hebrews 4, 16 tells us this, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may find mercy and grace to help in time of need. And oh, how we need to remember the words of 1 Peter 5, verse 7. Cast all your cares upon him, he cares for you. But not only should we pray to overcome our fear and to be the leaders God wants us to be, we must pray for our enemies. What did Stephen do in Acts chapter 7? He prayed for those who were there stoning him. What about Matthew chapter 5 verse 44? Jesus said, pray for your enemies, love them, do good to them. Luke 23, 34, again, Jesus taught us to pray for those who were enemies of the cross. Now, what are we going to pray? We're going to pray that they'll get out of the way and let us do the will of God. But more importantly, we're going to pray that they'll obey the gospel and they'll become Christians. We need to pray for protection against the enemies of the cross. Matthew 6, verse 13, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Luke chapter 22, verse 31, Jesus says to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith will not falter or fail. And oh, how we need to pray for strength. Strength to be the kind of people God wants us to and to accomplish his will. Notice again Hebrews 4, verse 16. What great strength it gives us. The Bible says... Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Look at what we can do in God's grace in his throne. We can, we can approach God. We can come to him in time of need and we can gain strength and encouragement from God through prayer. And so like Nehemiah, oh, how we need to have diligent, constant prayer to God. But to be the leaders and to complete the work that God has set before us, like Nehemiah and the people, we've got to organize properly and work diligently. What made Nehemiah such an effective leader? Nehemiah and his group had to work very diligently to rebuild the wall. As, an, as a leader, Nehemiah realized the value of an organized plan of approach. Now here's four steps Nehemiah took. Nehemiah first observed what needed to be done and where it needed to be done at. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. He set a time, Nehemiah 2, verse 6, and he made a plan of approach. He just didn't go in there half-cocked. He set a time. He made a plan of approach. Nehemiah gathered and used the proper tools, according to Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. And Nehemiah and his group worked hard to accomplish what God had set before them. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 18 and Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 6 following. Like Nehemiah, if we'll become leaders that God wants us to and use this same pattern, we can also accomplish the work set before us. We need to observe and take to heart what needs to be done and where it needs to be done at. Maybe we need to become more benevolent. Maybe that's a work where we could grow in. James teaches us the importance of doing good to those who are less fortunate. Listen to what the Bible says in James 1 verse 27. James says, Pure 
and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. One of the things that Christians are to do is to help those who are in need. The widows, the orphans, we have a responsibility to them. We're to do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith, Galatians 6 verse 10. Maybe there are ways that we can improve in our own Bible study. We need to think about what needs to be done and where. Maybe I need to ask myself, am I really, as a, a leader, as a Christian, studying the Bible like I ought to? You remember what Paul said to Timothy? Notice the words of 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Paul said, study or be diligent to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How we need to search the scriptures daily. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. How we need to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Matthew 5, verse 6. And how we need to have the, the zeal and the desire to study God's word and put it to use in our life. Maybe another area of improvement could be our, our edification and encouragement for other people. Hebrews 3, verses 12 and 13 teaches us, we've got to take heed, lest there be in any of us an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but encourage one another daily. Hebrews 10, verse 24, we're to encourage, to strengthen one another. But not only do we need to see what needs to be done, it can't stop there. We've got to make a time and a plan to work on this. If I need to improve in Bible study, if I need to grow in this area, I've got to set a plan to do that. I've got to say to myself, I need to start studying the Bible every day. Here's the time. Here's how I'm going to do that. I've got to gather the proper tools. I've got to make sure that I get everything out of my life and take the time to do that. And then I've got to work hard at doing what God wants me to do. As Jesus said, Night comes when no man works. Now's the time we need to use what God's given us to do His will. But then there's another key to doing the work that God wants us to, and that is you've got to be aware of the enemies and the critics of the work. Nehemiah had some enemies. He had some critics. And notice these people were trying to get him to stop doing the work of God. And thus he had to work hard to deal with their criticism. Here's what the enemy said. They were disturbed by the work. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 10 tells us, This work to them was like a crime. Nehemiah 2 verse 19, They mocked and made fun of the work, said you'll never complete it. Chapter 4 verses 1 through 3, They even tried to frustrate the work and stop them from doing that. In chapter 4 verses 7 through 8, And then they eventually go so far as to lie about the work and try to get it stopped. Nehemiah chapter 6 verses 5 through 9, Any leader who's trying to do a good work is going to have critics and going to have enemies. Make up your mind right now. As a leader, you're not going to make everybody happy and there's no need to even try. Here's what you need to do. You need to say to yourself, I'm going to make God happy and we're going to do our best to do the work that God has set before us. You've got to know how to deal with criticism and the keys to overcoming that criticism is to don't let them get in the way of you doing good. Don't let them stop you from doing what God has set before us. And so we must not let the enemies take advantage of us and cause us to stop doing the work of God. Now, another principle that we find in the book of Nehemiah is that we've got to work with our sword in our hand. Nehemiah chapter 4 illustrates this idea. We find in Nehemiah 4 verse 17, the Bible says, Those who built on the wall... And those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction, notice this, and with the other hand they held the weapon. Here they've got to protect themselves. Some are trying to take advantage of them, don't want them to rebuild the wall. They're working with their sword in their hand. That's how they succeeded. For leaders and Christians in the church today, we've got to have that spiritual sword, the Word of God in mind at all times so that we can do the work God wants us to. You'll never complete the work of God if you don't take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What's our sword today? Look again at Ephesians 6, verse 17. And the Bible says, And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. Well, why do we take up the Word of God? It is this Word that will give us direction. It will guide us in how to do God's work. Notice Psalm 119, 105. The Bible says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. If I'm going to do the work of God, 
I've got to make sure that I take up God's Word as that lamp and as that light to give me direction. The Word of God will also help us to make the right decisions in our work. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, The Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. When we're doing the work of God, what's the guide? How are we going to know to make the right decisions? It's right here in the book. The work of God can also be done as we hold the Spirit close. It helps us not to get involved in a life of sin. You remember the words of Psalm 119 verse 11? Your word I have hidden in my heart so that I might not sin against you. If I'm going to do the work of God, I've got to make sure that I don't get involved in a life of sin, that I stay free from sin, for sin will hinder the work of God. It'll help us stay prepared for battle, and eventually it will help us to overcome Satan. Satan is going to, I can promise you this, Satan is going to do everything possible to hinder the work, to make sure that we don't spread the gospel, to keep us from being what we ought to be. We can overcome him through God's word. Notice the beautiful teaching of Revelation 12, verse 11. The Bible says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto the death. How did Christians overcome Satan by the word of God? Well, first of all, notice there's this three-step approach to their overcoming the devil. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, Notice that's the sacrifice of Jesus, the word of their testimony, which we now have as scripture, and self-sacrifice, they did not love their lives unto the death. There will be no overcoming Satan without the blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins. And so you've got to access the blood of Jesus. He's that great sacrifice to help us overcome sin. But notice they did not love their lives unto the death. That was self-sacrifice. They were willing to fully give themselves to the cause of Christ, even if it cost them their life. They knew, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Revelation 14, verse 13. They knew, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalm 116, verse 15. Death is not the worst thing for a Christian. For Jesus said in John 11, verse 24 and 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, Jesus said, he'll live again. And so they overcame him by by the blood of the Lamb, sacrifice. They didn't love their lives to so death, self-sacrifice. But notice also the word of their testimony. They overcame Satan by the word. We overcome Satan today also by the word of God. It is living and powerful. Hebrews 4 verse 12. It is able to help us live the right life. And as James 1.21 says, we're to receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. Don't ever underestimate the value of God's word. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 15 verse 16, Your words were found and I did eat them, and they were to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Jeremiah said God's word is like a, a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces. It has the power to transform and to change our lives. Well, let's think for just a moment then about some specific areas of work, especially that we can improve in. Some areas where maybe we need to put effort to so that we can be better servants in the kingdom of God. All of us need to make sure that we work diligently to grow in Christ. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter said in 1 Peter 2 verse 2, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. We don't need to get stagnant. We don't need to reach a point where we say, I'm where I need to be in Christianity and I can just take it easy. Some had already done that. In Hebrews 5 verse 12, and the Hebrews writer says, by this time, 
You ought to be teachers. You have need that someone teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You come to need milk and not solid food. By this time, they should have been mature. They should have been growing in the meat of God's Word. And here some of them likely have been Christians for 30, maybe 40 years, and they don't even know the fundamentals. They're still babes in Christ. And thus, we need to hunger and thirst after righteousness so that we can grow as children of God. An area especially that we need to grow in is knowledge of God's Word. There is a dearth of biblical knowledge in our world today. There's a drought for the Word of God. Not that the Word of God's not available, but people no longer study the Bible like they used to. How we need to, to take heed to the encouragement of Paul to Timothy. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. As Ezra was a leader during this time of restoration, we can take great encouragement from his example. Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to do it and to teach its statutes and judgments in all Israel. Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10. And the Bible says that the heart of the righteous person studies to show himself approved unto God. Luke chapter 4, here's the example of Jesus. Jesus in Luke 2 and in Luke 4 is in the temple teaching the scholars and they're amazed at his knowledge of God's Word. How we need to grow in our knowledge of God and His Word and how we need to practically study the Bible each and every day. We need to search the Scriptures daily to see if what we're being taught is true to the will of God and the teaching of Jesus Christ. An area of work that we also need to grow and improve in is teaching the gospel to the lost. What is our responsibility? What are some of the last words that Jesus said to his disciples? Go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. Matthew 28, verse 18. Mark 16, 15, we're to take the gospel to all nations, to the lost. How we need to take seriously the command of Jesus to go and spread the word. What made the church so powerful in the book of Acts? How is it that multitudes, 3,000, 5,000, are converted to the cause of Christ? Acts 8, verse 4 helps us. Those who were scattered went everywhere teaching the word. Think about Acts chapter 5, verses 41 and 42. Here, Peter and John have been told specifically, don't teach in the name of Jesus. And they laid stripes upon their back and told them, you don't go out of here and talk about Jesus anymore. And the Bible then says, and daily in the temple and from house to house, they cease not preaching and teaching Jesus as the Christ. We need that mindset that every day we're going to work diligently. You see, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. How we need to take encouragement and do what God says as it relates to evangelism. Jesus did. Luke 19, 10, the scripture says, Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. And we must also do the same today. We also need to take seriously God's command to make sure that we're right with Him. Friend, are you sure today that you've been working diligently and that you have found God's plan of salvation? There are so many out there who will say to you, this is what God says to do to be saved and here's God's plan of salvation and this is exactly what you need to follow, but they never back that up by the book. We want to think for just a minute about making sure that we're following God's leadership as it relates to the plan of salvation. What must a person do to become a Christian? That great question is asked in Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the Bible makes it abundantly clear what one must do. You first must be willing to hear and listen to the Word of God. Do you realize today that this book, is the sole authority on all matters and that we must only follow it. The Bible says in Revelation 22, 18 and 19, we're not to add to, we're not to take away, we're to only do the will of God. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17 that faith comes by hearing and hearing 
by the Word of God? Have you heard God's Word? If so, are you willing to believe that Jesus is God's Son? Jesus said in John 8, 24, Unless you believe that I'm He, you will surely die in your sins. There's no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Have you repented of sin in your life? In Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, certain Jews come to Jesus, and it's as though they want to justify themselves. They say to Jesus, what about these people who had their blood mingled with their sacrifice? Weren't they worse sinners than all else? Or these 18 people who are walking down the road and the Tower of Siloam falls on them. Weren't they worse sinners than all else? Do you know what Jesus says? Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Repentance is a turning from sin and turning to God. We must bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Luke chapter 3 and verse 6. Have you made that good confession just as the Ethiopian eunuch did? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Acts chapter 8 verse 37. Paul taught us that we must do that. For in Romans 10 verse 10, the Bible says, with the heart, with the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And have you followed God's leadership by submitting to His teaching on baptism? Listen carefully. There are a multitude of people in our religious world who will say to you that baptism isn't essential. Yes, it's something good to do, but it's not essential. You don't have to worry about doing it to be saved. You can do that two weeks later or a month later just to simply be added to the church. Friends, the Bible teaches baptism is essential to salvation. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. The Apostle Paul was told in Acts 22, 16, You need to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. May God help each of us to look to our own lives and to make sure that we're really submitting to the will of God and to help us as Christians to be the leaders that we ought to be so that we can accomplish the greatest work in the world, spreading the gospel of Christ to a lost and dying world. Friend, we hope today that you'll obey the gospel and that you will live your life by God's leadership. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.